Space Operations Engineer here at SpaceX. Now, as many of you know, Starship is SpaceX's latest and largest vehicle developed to date. It represents a fully reusable transportation system designed to carry both crew and cargo to Earth orbit, the Moon, Mars, and beyond. If you've been following the development of Starship over the last couple of years, you know we've been doing a lot of testing leading up to this big one. Once fully developed, it will be the world's most powerful launch vehicle with twice the thrust of Saturn V rocket and the ability to carry up to 150 metric tons to orbit. For reference, a one liter bottle of water is one kilogram, so 150, 150 metric tons is basically 150,000 one liter bottles of water, or as I like to think of it, one rather lonely blue whale. <sighs> Now, today's test will be the first of many as we work towards transitioning Starship from a developmental to an operational program. Our primary objective today is to gather as much data as we can around the fully integrated vehicles. That means the booster and the Starship and the ground systems. While we have flown Starship in the past, this will be the first attempt of Super Heavy and the first opportunity to validate how the two vehicles operate together. Well, Super Heavy will fire up its 33 Raptor engines and it'll lift off from the launch pad down in South Texas. About three minutes into the flight, we're going to hope to see the Super Heavy separate from the Starship spacecraft. It'll then perform a flip maneuver. So there's that. You can see that on your screen. And then it'll boost back in order to make a hard landing in the Gulf of Mexico. And while that's happening, we hope to see Starship's six second stage engines ignite and watch as Starship coasts for about an hour at altitudes ranging between 150 and 250 kilometers before re-entering Earth's atmosphere and make its own hard landing in the Pacific Ocean about 250-ish kilometers offshore. the Mission Control Center here behind us here in Hawthorne, California. Um, but with that being said, our very own Zachary Lupin is, at, is uh, one of our SpaceX employees at our watch event in South Padre Island. Hey, Zach, how are things going on the ground? It is a great day for a test launch today, Kate. Hello, everyone. My name is Zachary Lupin, and I'm an avionics reliability engineer here at SpaceX, and I'm at the Cameron County Amphitheater, where a growing number of SpaceX employees are gathering to watch what we hope is the first liftoff of a fully integrated Starship. Now, the Starship team has worked incredibly hard for today's launch test. Uh, over the past weekend, teams held a launch readiness review, which included a comprehensive review of all of our vehicle systems, looking at avionics, GNC, communications, software, structures, as well as our Raptor engines and propulsion in general. Now, we are only about five miles away from the launch pad, so it's a pretty good view for today. And as we get into uh, as we start to approach uh, T minus zero, everyone here is clearly very excited uh, for the events that are happening today. Uh, so as we get closer to T zero, I'm going to throw it back to Hawthorne to talk more about a rocket. Awesome. Thanks so much, Zach. And we've actually got a little bit of a crowd forming behind us, too. Now, we've got a shot of Starship on the screen. The entire Starship structure you see is made of stainless steel. And when that's fully stacked, it stands about 120 meters tall and about nine meters around. To help you give a sense of just how big that is, we've captured a video of some of our teams doing final integration prep work in advance of today's test flight. Just like Falcon 9, Starship has two stages, which we will talk a little bit more about in a minute. But in addition to those two stages, uh, Starship actually has a third stage called Stage Zero. It consists of all the launch pad infrastructure built around the rocket. Uh, you can see a great view of it there on your screen. Um, it's truly an engineering feat in its own right. And I feel like it's something we don't talk about very often. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes into fueling and preparing the launch vehicle before an, a large test like this, really any launch. Now, let's talk about Super Heavy. The name says it all. It's super, it's heavy, it's super heavy. 
It goes by some other names, the first stage or the booster, but whatever you call it, the Super Heavy will be the vehicle responsible for powering Starship against that mighty gravitational pull we've got here on Earth. And when it's fully operational, it's going to get Starship to orbit. The booster alone stands about 70 meters tall and is about the same height as a fully integrated Falcon 9, but with a diameter roughly 2.5 times that of Falcon 9 and with 33 much larger engines. Yeah, and having those engines, and oh my gosh, I love this shot. We can see uh, looking up into the launch mount at the 33 engines on the booster. Those are each of the Raptor engines that's going to power today's launch attempt. Yeah, this is an incredible view. One of my favorite views that we're going to get today. Uh, we don't have this kind of view on our Falcon 9 launches, so um, this is so exciting to see. You can even make out uh, the paint markers indicating which engine is which. Like we said, there are 33 of them. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of fire that's going to be coming out from uh, those engines in just uh, over 31 minutes from now. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, there are 33 of them on the, on the Super Heavy, the booster, uh, and the, we don't see it right now, but the cluster in the, in the center are the ones that are actually going to gimbal and help uh, steer the booster back down for its water landing in the Gulf. Yeah, and they're a little bit different, Kate, than our Falcon engines. Um, so on Falcon, we use a, a gas generator cycle. Here's a fantastic shot actually at the, the inner stage so we can see the six engines that are on the ship side, three gimbling in the middle, and then the, the vacuum engines. You can see two of them and the other ones on the other side of the cluster in the middle here. So Raptor's a little bit different. It uses something called stage combustion, which means we basically pre-burn both the uh, the fuel side and the ox side, and then get those up to the right temperatures and pressures and then mix them in the combustion chamber. It allows us to get higher thrust and higher efficiency on these engines than on Falcon 9. Starship, or the spacecraft, is the second stage and makes up the top portion of the vehicle. It's designed for carrying passengers and cargo between destinations on Earth, Earth orbit, and planetary destinations. It stands 50 meters tall, a little taller than the Statue of Liberty. It's comprised of six Raptors. We saw those uh, just moments ago. Three of them are optimized for sea level and the other three are vacuum engines. Um, and like they're op optimized to operate in the vacuum of space. They provide a maximum of 258,000 tons of thrust in vacuum. Uh, the spacecraft is also outfitted with four flaps to help aerodynamically control the vehicle's attitude during atmospheric flight and enable precise landing at the intended location. You can see a view of those flaps there. wrapped in a heat shield, which is composed of 18,000 hexagonal ceramic tiles designed to insulate the vehicle during atmospheric entry, where temperatures can be as high as 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. The hex-shaped tiles, like these ones that we have here, uh, roughly make up about two-thirds of the vehicle. Uh, there's a couple of different geometries. The one that I have is for the circular portions of uh, the vehicle, so it has this this curvature to it, um, and the one that Shiva has. Yeah, this uh, this kind is a hexagonal shape, um, and there's several thousand of these all across the body of the vehicle. And it's, it's worth saying we need these because when a spacecraft re-enters from orbital velocity, it's going faster than the speed of sound, and and causes a lot of heat to build up uh, that has to get dissipated by these heat shield tiles. Yeah, John. Thanks, Kate, and good morning. I'm John Innsbrucker. Principal Integration Engineer here at SpaceX. We're currently loading propellant from the ground system into both the first and second stages. Now both vehicles use the same two propellants. Our fuel is liquid methane at a temperature of just over 100 kelvins or about minus 272 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this is a different fuel from Falcon 9 where we use RP-1 kerosene. And our oxidizer is liquid oxygen, the same as Falcon 9. But because there's no oxygen in space to support combustion, we have to bring our own. We 
everything is looking good, Kate. In order to make life multi-planetary, we need a fully reusable vehicle that's capable of carrying a huge amount of cargo and a lot of people to orbit and have a pretty quick turnaround. The idea is to effectively reuse launch vehicles just like airplanes. <laughs> Crowd is getting excited here uh, in Hawthorne uh, behind Mission Control, as you can hear. Now, imagine if you had to wait for a new airplane to be constructed every time you wanted to fly. You'd rarely go anywhere and it would probably be completely unaffordable for most of us. In order for us to get to Mars and back with lots of people multiple times, reusability is a must. Now in the near term and a bit closer to home here on Earth, Starship will be critical to other programs as well. Once it's operational, Starship will deliver the full size and upgraded version of our Starlink satellites. And that's super exciting because our next generation satellites represent a step forward in Starlink's capabilities and will provide more bandwidth and increased reliability started on ship. to connect millions of people around the world with high speed internet. It's an exciting future, but let's talk a little about how we got to today. Now, Starship testing ramped up in July of 2019 with the Star Hopper prototype. It's sort of a, a short version of the Starship that we see today. There's a picture of it on your screen, the lovable water tower. Now, standing at just over 18 meters tall, the Star Hopper had a single engine and was test flown to perform landing and low level altitude maneuvers. Starship's initial flight test was a hop that reached about 20 meters in altitude. This was followed by a second hop, the one that we've got on our screen, that rose to 150 meters in altitude. We uh, took a little jaunt away from the launch pad and ended up landing about 100 meters or so further away from it. And you can see that on your screen. Now, notably, this was the first time that we had used a Raptor engine in flight and demonstrated control of this kind. <laughs> As a Star Wars fan, I can't not see a flying R2-D2 there. <laughs> <laughs> now, after a series of 150 meter hop tests with earlier prototypes, the Starship program saw a huge breakthrough during a test flight of the vehicle known as Serial Number 8 or SN8. SN8 demonstrated a first of its kind controlled aerodynamic descent and landing flip maneuver. Yes, I'm talking about the belly flop. <laughs> this 12.5 kilometer hop test took place December 2020 and saw the SN8 prototype ascend to an altitude of 12 and a half kilometers and conduct a belly flop maneuver. While it didn't stick the landing, the test was a major milestone in the development of Starship. I love seeing the belly flop maneuver. Now, testing continued with the prototype on serial number nine. That was a 10 kilometer flight test in February of 2021. We had a nominal ascent, engine cutoff, reorientation and control descent were stable. However, we unfortunately had a dramatic ending to the end of that flight when we had a failure on its engine to relight that resulted in one of those rapid unscheduled disassemblies. But what was really, really exciting about both serial numbers eight and nine is how quickly we were able to achieve just our primary objectives in those two high altitude test flights. In addition to getting lots of great data, Starship successfully demonstrated control of the vehicle and subsonic reentry capability. Ultimately, we, perf we performed nine Starship high altitude test flights in total. And in May of 2021, SN15 launched from Starbase, reached an altitude of about 10 kilometers, performed a number of maneuvers, and safely returned to the launch site. This was the first Starship prototype to fly, control its descent, safely land, and to be recovered in one piece. Now, so having achieved that success in our suborbital campaign, one of the next big challenges for upper stage reusability is to survive the high heating hypersonic phase of entry. Combined with the ability to refill our Starship's tank with fuel and oxygen while on orbit is what will enable a fully reusable transportation system that's designed to carry both crew and cargo on these long duration interplanetary flights. And that's ultimately what will help humanity return to the moon and travel to Mars and beyond in our solar system. Thanks, Shiva. Clock is coming up on T minus 17 minutes from liftoff. We're continuing to click towards zero. However, right now we've just begun listening in. The first stage team is working a pressurization issue. They're troubleshooting that right now. 
Now we do have the option if need be, if we can't solve this, then we would hold the count and probably treat today as a wet dress and not be able to launch. However, we are continuing to do propellant loading on both the super heavy and the ship stages. So you can really tell, like, it's a beautiful location. It's close to the ocean. There's tons of wildlife. And that's because being close to the equator is actually a fantastic way to get to orbit. Yeah. I love that we have so many employee events that allow us to participate uh, with ocean cleanup and other environmental efforts uh, there. Uh, we'd also like to thank Cameron County for being so supportive uh, for all of our work in that area. Now, in addition to Starbase, we'll soon be adding another Texas location to the SpaceX family. We're opening a new facility in Bastrop, Texas, just outside of Austin, to support Starlink hardware production. The new facility will be over 500,000 square feet of manufacturing space, and the team has already started hiring. Now we have all kinds of openings in production and manufacturing for technicians and leadership and manufacturing engineers and all kinds of site support roles. Basically, if you can think of a role, we're probably hiring for it. So if you're interested in helping expand human life to other planets or helping internet access here on Earth, consider becoming part of the SpaceX team at SpaceX.com slash careers. We're just inside T minus nine minutes and counting. We're listening on one of the background loops right now. Flight director is talking about the issue we've had on first stage, uh, working the pressurization system. Decision right now is that we are going to stop the launch for today. We're going to transition the launch attempt to a wet dress rehearsal. So that means we're gonna continue with the countdown sequence of events. We'll continue loading propellant, finishing up here shortly on the second stage. We'll also continue loading propellant onto the first stage, wrapping up at T minus three minutes.